good folks. Uh, I hope everyone is doing as well as possible and staying safe and sane in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Davari Robinson with Asia for the Carolinas, and I'm happy to welcome you to this virtual program through our Center for Nonprofit Sustainability. Uh, Gina Allen of Gina Allen Consulting will be leading this session on how to have a successful online board meeting. Uh, Gina's been working with nonprofits and focusing on online engagement uh, for a number of years. So you have a great person to, to lead this talk today. Uh, this topic is especially relevant as social distancing guidelines are expected to last for the foreseeable future. Uh, last month in April, <coughs> Governor Cooper signed an executive order that not only permits but encourages North Carolina corporations to have remote shareholder meetings. So why does this specifically cover nonprofits? We think that this order should be looked at in tandem with remote board meetings. Um, so we're happy to have Gene walk through the best ways to accomplish this. Um, if you have any questions during the session, we ask that you use the chat function and send a message. Um, if time permits, we'll address questions at the end. And if we're unable to do so, we'll follow up with answers after the session. Uh, to help ensure a smooth audio and visual session, um, please mute your microphones and even consider turning off your cameras. Uh, this session is being recorded and we'll post it onto our website. Uh, so thank you again for attending this session and I'll now turn it over to Gene Allen. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. I bet like many of you, you're sitting there going, how do we run these online? So you've taken all your ideas and you've thrown them onto the online world and we know it can be better. So I set this up thinking specifically about board meetings and board meetings are unique in that it has a specific focus and it's a business meeting. Like somebody's mute needs to go on. Somebody's phone still sounds like it's making noise. Okay. So the idea of a board meeting is because they're a business meeting and they are a specific focus and you know who's coming to the meeting. You could use a lot of these ideas for any meeting, but other meetings are different and they might not be the business meeting. They don't have people that you necessarily know who's going to show up. So you want to make sure you can do things differently when you have a group you don't know. So that today we're focusing just on board meetings because of their specific focus. I'm going to introduce just a little bit about me. I probably know some of you. I can't see all your names right now. This is me. I am a trainer, facilitator, speaker. Here's a background noise. Somebody's still making noise. Anyway, somewhere I use board source as my material. I'm a board source certified governance trainer. So I use a lot of the board source material. I've been doing research on this idea of online meetings. My interest with NC Tech for Good, which is based out of Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill. We try to bring nonprofits together with um, as a volunteer group, nonprofits and tech together, we're, we're, we're similar in interest with Apero, but they're much higher skilled because they are employees in an organization. We are just a bunch of volunteers. So that's one of my interests in this and also teach, teach in the Duke Nonprofit Management Program, which is a certificate program. Just want to share you something. I use Zoom a lot for these meetings. We're not using that today. There's also Microsoft Windows. There's WebEx. There are a lot of platforms out there. And they're all learning from each other and they're all becoming closer and closer together with what they offer. What I'm sharing on screen here is the idea that you can usually manipulate some of these screens so that you can see the chat box and the people and the slides. So you just have to practice and see what the limitations or the possibilities are of your program. The idea is make the screen work for you if you're going to hold meetings. And then once you learn, bring your board members in so that they can learn how to use this as well. This is a screen where what I like to do is get some information from you. Now, if I were doing this in Zoom, because I know how to do it there, you could use the annotation tools. But I do it in other programs as well. So basically, you can use annotation tools, which means you could put something up on your screen at a board meeting and have people, if you show them how to go annotate, they can then go and check which one they belong in. But since we're not doing that today, I have a second way you can get interaction from people. And I would like you to identify yourself decide which category are you in, one, two, three, or four, and it goes one down, two, and then three in the corner, and four down, Where are you? and then just type it in the chat box. So just put a number in there, one, two, three, or four, and we'll see kind of a sense of who's at the meeting.
Well, Jane's at a 10. Good. <laughs> so what I'm seeing looking at this, it rushes by, but I'll tell you a couple of thoughts. One is I'm seeing, at first I saw a lot of threes, which is people who've led a number of meetings, and that's excellent. Because that means you've already tried this and tried to work. I'm seeing a lot of ones, which people mean I'm kind of new to this, haven't led meetings. Saw a couple of fours and a couple of twos. So you're pretty spread out, but I thought I saw a lot of threes, which meant yeah, you've led a couple of meetings, but you're still learning. But the other thing you can do with using a chat box, if you were having a board meeting and asked a question, you could have people respond to their answers in a chat box. But then you could ask another board member, like I could say, Bear or Rosie or one of these people that's in my meeting, can you look through the chat box, which would only be 12 people then, we have 52 here, but if you only had say 12 or 16 on your board, it wouldn't be as many as what we're seeing. And you could say to your board member, Libby or Rosie, could you go through the chat box and why don't you sum up what you're seeing? And that way you're engaging somebody else, you're using the chat box for everybody to give an answer to something, you ask a question, they're answering on the chat box, and then you have another member <laughs> You have another member reading the answers on the chat box and kind of summing it back up to you so that that's a way you're engaging different people. I've broken this up into before the meeting, during the meeting, and after the meeting. What you can do to get ready, run the meeting, and then follow up afterwards. Just some ideas in being an online meeting. So we start with before the meeting, and my very first thing I want to say to you is this is the moment to embrace the consent agenda. If you haven't done that yet, because and consent agendas help make you have a tighter meeting because you're spending more time on the future and less time on just listening to reports. It's not going to work in an online meeting to, to, to take your meeting that's maybe got a lot of reports and do it online. It's just people aren't going to sit there and listen to reports. So it's a great time to sit, how, to embrace the consent agenda. The other thing to think about is you need to schedule important discussion for when people are fresh. So if you have a meeting that's from five to six, you might want to make sure that your important issues comment when you think is the best time for your group, which could be, say, like 5.20, 5.15 to 5.30. People are engaged. They've been there. The people might be more inclined to be in, able to jump into a deeper discussion. Don't want to have surprises, so it's nice to share the agenda ahead of time. Oh, and I'm not going to go all about the consent agenda today. I'm just saying that's something you could consider if you have it, which a lot of you do, I'm sure, but a lot of you don't. You could look it up, you could get for help. How do we start doing a consent agenda? But the one I really want to tell you is there's more prep needed. So if I'm facilitating a meeting, I can watch the room, I get visual cues, I can know who's talking and who's not talking. There's a lot of information that I'm not going to get if I'm facilitating an online meeting. So what you need to do to the further prep would be to decide for each topic you're going to talk about, what's your going to be your engagement tool? Are you going to use the chat box? Are you going to use a visual discussion? Are you going to use a group discussion? If you have the ability to break people into small groups, are you going to do small groups? So you need to kind of plot through what tool you're going to use. And the other thing I suggest is think of some of the questions you're going to ask. If you want to have people have a deeper discussion, write some of those questions down because, you know, like I can rely on myself when I'm in a meeting and I can kind of watch the room. If you've written down a question, you have that to look at. If, it, if you don't need it and you go with a better question, that's great. But I would recommend a little more prep than normal for how you're going to engage people, specific tools you want to use online, and then what questions you want to ask. Because you, it just, it's a lot harder to see what the mood is, and you got to kind of have something already ready. Some of the positives, as you know, cost, convenience, attendance. Attendance, yes, sometimes that people are finding more people are attending because they don't have to drive somewhere. And there's a certain efficiency. I suspect we're going to find some aspects of online meetings that are better than face-to-face. -face. What you say? No way. Yes, I do think that's possible. And then you're going to have to bring that back to when you start having face-to-face -face meetings again. So you're going to bring the best of your face-to-face -face meetings online, and you're going to take the best of what's online back to the face-to-face. -face. However, we have challenges. And those challenges, as you know, will be how do you facilitate? How do you make it so people all talk over each other, and then we all stop? And then we talk over each other again. How do you get people really engaged? Because it's a flat screen. Technology issues, people speaking, people screen, they leave, you know, they have to come back in. And then you have to think about your legal issues, conflict of interest, in the sense of if you have conflict of interest in a normal meeting space, people leave the room and come back in. So you need to think ahead of time, what's our procedure going to be for leaving the room and coming back? And it could be if somebody has a conflict of interest that they leave the meeting, they check out. 
It could be they mute their screen. That might not be enough for you. You might say you have to leave the meeting and then when we're done, we'll text you and you come back. You have to decide what matters to your nonprofit, what feels like the legal steps you need to take. So think about how are we gonna handle conflict of issue? So the first time it happens, you're not like, what do we do? Where I would start before the meeting is think about what makes a good board meeting, period. And what makes a bad board meeting? And then pull that good board meeting stuff into your meeting. So if I were to ask people, generally I would hear, oh, people are prepared, people show up, people are willing to discuss, we can have good discussions, it's lively, people are engaged and committed and they're great. I think you can do all that online. What makes a bad board meeting is when people, there's not enough people there, or the same people keep talking, or we just hear reports. I mean, you know the, you know the stories, but I would ask your board, or I would ask the people, a committee that are planning, what are two or three elements that make a good board meeting and how can we focus and make sure we can make that happen online? And what do we want to not happen? I've had some really good success using Zoom. I know other people have had good success using Windows Teams and others have used Google Hangouts. So it depends on what system you might already be using. People use WebEx and feel like they're having a very successful meeting. If you only have six people, you might just leave your mics open and everybody talk. But I think there's some ways you can break people into groups and just use different ways to have people stop and think, think and write instead of just open discussion the whole time. Before the meeting, you do what we did today is you make sure you test the mic and the video. Just because you can record doesn't mean you should. If you don't normally record your meetings now, then I wouldn't record your meetings because it becomes part of the searchable documents of your organization. If you just if you start recording, that might allow some of your board members to feel like they don't need to be there. But this isn't a training when you're having a board meeting. It's a meeting. You need people live and being there. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. You need to decide, is recording a good thing for us? What I would suggest before you do a meeting, if it starts at noon, tell people to get there at 11.30 and you're gonna practice screen share in case somebody, the treasurer has a document to share or one of the committees has something they want, a picture they took of something they wanna share. There's reasons that you might wanna do some screen share. So have people practice screen sharing. You might wanna practice having people mute themselves and unmute so that you can have quiet while one person's talking, but people can quickly answer a question if you call on them, rather than having to figure out then what they need to do to unmute. There might be people, if you're in a meeting, I presume you're not, you're gonna be showing your faces more. However, we've discovered some people's bandwidth is such that they can't very easily do audio and video. So sometimes people will be there and they need to mute their video so that they can listen and talk because once they have both audio and video on, it's very garbled. So just be aware that sometimes that helps if you got a muted, if you got a garbled person, tell them, turn off your video for right now and let them just listen. And then they could come back in occasionally and wave. And if you do something visual, a visual connection with each other, they could come in and then go back out. So you want to check your bylaws to make sure you understand what it says about virtual meetings. You have to plan the agenda and you're going to practice some of these other pieces of the technology. People have asked, how do we vote when we're having a meeting? One suggestion is you do a roll call and just have people like this picture that people can say yes or no and you can capture who said it and their name. The other idea if you're having an official vote is you could do it in your chat box. You could again do it by a roll call so it's in order and you can see or you could have everybody vote at the same time, but you need to make sure you have a way that's, um, you can see how people voted. You don't wanna have a nonverbal way to vote. You don't wanna have a, a, people, a place that would be nonverbal and non-visual where for everybody. That's usually what the rules say. So I can't just send an email to one person, but you need to see what your bylaws say and make sure you're following what those laws are. When you're deciding what platform to use, because you don't know what to use yet, you've tried something, you're not sure if it's the best. Let me just give you some considerations. And by the way, most of what we're gonna talk about today here is the human side of making these online meetings. I'm gonna briefly touch on tech pieces, not deep into any platform, but just kind of a, a brush over the top of what are some considerations you should look for. Somebody had a question about which platform allows you to raise your hand. So that's exactly what you need to start asking is how can I find a platform that allows me to raise my hand? I know you can do it in Zoom. I'm not sure if you can do it in Google Hangouts. So that's something that you can actually Google and start going and figuring out which platform meets my needs. Access, will everyone have access to it? Some people are using their VPN from their office, 
and they're logging in through an office connection and their office connection might have firewalls where they can't get to certain programs. I know this happens when they're in their office. But this might still be happening. So it's just a consideration to think about. Some people, even though they live very close in to your area in Charlotte, as we know, there's, there are places everywhere this doesn't have good energy. Number two, utility. Will it support the work we're doing? So you might already be locked into Windows 365 and using Windows 10. And the advantage of doing that is that you can stay within the program that you already need. I know some groups, we're getting some feedback in here again. Somebody's phone is not muted. Everybody, everybody just take a second and check and make sure you're muted because there's some noise coming through somebody's phone or screen. Thank you. So utility will support the work we're doing. This idea is locking it into whatever system you're already using, because you might not want to use Google Hangouts if you're using Microsoft 365 and then sometimes doing Zoom. There might be a reason you want to stay with one platform, particularly for your board meetings, because people get better at using the platform as you continue. Uh, I have a comment here from Angie saying in Zoom, if we vote in the chat function, can we grab that chat function text to record in the minutes? What I would do is read it out loud to make sure you get it into the minutes, just to make sure. You sometimes can capture the chat. You can take a picture of it, the chat function, but that's why I think you can do a verbal, read it out and say how each person voted. So you have a verbal and a written score of that. The third thing to think about is the cost. So I know Zoom has the 40 minute free version for nonprofits. TechSoup gives you all sorts of good possibilities right now for getting into um, the administrative license for the different programs. I know groups that use Google Hangouts because it's free and they feel very comfortable with it. So you need to decide what works for you. I know some places, have a, a board member who might bring WebEx from their office or some program they use from their office. And that could be very useful. You just want to make sure you understand what are your control elements and who, how many people can share controls and just understand how that works. Is there technical support available? That would be important if you're using your board member program. That would be important if you think there are people who are going to be signing in who don't understand. That's why I said offer some some help ahead of time. If 30 minutes before the meeting starts, just get everybody to log on who has any anybody with any lack of confidence or not sure they understand how to use the features. Just get them to log on ahead of time and work with them so everybody understands. But sometimes you need tech support because somebody falls off during the meeting. So having a cell phone backup, having somebody designate as the person who will pick up if there's a tech problem. Security issues. You probably heard about Zoom having some security issues recently. They were really up front with trying to get forward with having a very accessible platform and they didn't spend time on the security. Now they say they're ramping that up and they're using passwords. You're conducting business. You want to make sure that you have security, that you're not going to be Zoom bombed or you're not going to have other people taking over your screen. So just ask those questions. Have somebody answer. I mean, I've found both Zoom and Google to be easy that way. Something to think about. The next one is, can we train our people? So you want to know how easy is it to use this program? How hard is it to train people? Our people, you know your people. Are they really tech savvy? Are they tech beginners? Can you pair them up with somebody? You know your people. You want to be able to train them. So make sure you understand the platform. During the meeting. So this is where we're going to talk a lot more about how you get the people engaged and have conversations during the meeting. What you're trying to do during the meeting is connect, collaborate, and get feedback. I mean, that's you don't want to just have a one-way report for your meeting. You want to have people connecting. You want to have people collaborating on ideas and you want to have a way for people to be able to give feedback. So you want to think about how we can encourage collaborative problem solving. There's ways you can share, like with Google Docs, you could have share a screen where you all go to Google Docs and type together or at different times. You could have questions set up. You could everybody brainstorm at the same time. Give agenda time to all. What I mean by that is, like I said earlier, you could have a different person read the chat box. If we put something in the chat box, you could have someone else who's going to share the financial report. I'm going to give an example in just a minute about different roles you can assign people to have during the meeting. The more everybody's involved, the more engaged you're going to keep people. What I mean by engage mute, I mentioned earlier, help people understand how they can find mute on this program that you're using and mute and unmute. So if their kid comes in the background screaming, they can quickly mute. And if they're getting ready to talk or if I call on somebody, they can quickly unmute and we don't have to spend a long time with them learning how to do that. So just practice that. Practice mute and unmuting. Engage it instead of just everybody on mute and leave it there. It might be a good thing if people have 
lots going on in the background to have them be able to mute, but you also want them to engage with you. And I'm going to suggest that you co-create your rules of engagement. I'm going to give you some ideas, but don't just take those. Have your board discuss how do we want to operate online? How do we, what's going to work for us online? So we start with some icebreakers. I was out there looking to see how are people suggesting that they're going to do icebreakers for online meetings. And there's two ideas that popped up. I think you might enjoy these. And the idea is how do you connect people? Because we're not in the same room. We're all sitting in our houses now. And you can do some easy, fun things with that. So two ideas I saw was take a picture of your shoes or take a picture of the object on your desk or the table that you're sitting at. So the idea is just to have a way to share with people. And you can have everybody start the meeting by taking a picture and then they share their phone and put that up on the screen. I'll show you what that looks like. Just a way to have people share and have fun. So they could send the pictures to you ahead of time and you could have just play, play a quick game on whose feet is this or whose desk is this or just show it and have people tell a story or just show it for fun. Here's what it looked like when one board came together and they all took pictures of their feet and then they showed that. So it was just kind of like saying, here's what my feet look like and they laughed and it was just a way to connect and show the more human side. I like to ask people, which view do you like more? And then having done this, what I have discovered, I like one, but I have found there is an equal number of people in the world who like two, which means getting people to share their, on their video isn't necessarily going to be easy for everybody. Some people don't want to have to show their picture. So you're going to have to work with people and say, it's a meeting. We want to encourage you to be part of this conversation and encourage people to understand what it means to be sharing themselves because that might not be comfortable for some people but because you're sharing your face you're sharing your background and you want people to you know we can zoom has those virtual backgrounds i have a background behind me some people are going to have people walking behind them because they can't be in a room that's separate so you just gonna have to work with that and get people comfortable one thing i do suggest is i was on a meeting recently and one of the people had the um the, the computer was in front of her her face, but she was a um, bright window behind her. So she looked like she was a hostage video because all we could see was a silhouette. So you, you want people not to be in a hostage silhouette situation. So you want to ask people to be aware of their background so they can you can see who they are. I mean, all we had to do was ask the person, but it was just kind of funny because we couldn't see a thing about her. During the meeting, you want to rotate roles, not during that meeting, but meeting to meeting. So I'm going to give you some roles and the next meeting Second meeting, switch roles around so that everybody's engaged in a different way. Check in with a round robin. Make sure you're calling on everybody. If you just say, hey, here's something to consider. What do you think? And everybody speaks at the same time and everybody stops. And then the people who always speak, speak up again. The people who are quiet sit there. So what you want to do is whenever you have a question, just do a round robin and make that kind of a, a practice when you're on these meetings. And people can pass. Or people could say nothing to add, but you want to make sure you call on everybody so the person who's reflective and has to think gets as much time as the person who can jump in and that you don't keep going to the same people. Use screen sharing where you need to, be aware of background noise, and I talked about visual, but also if you have audio, so that's that muting back and forth. And ask people to turn off the alerts on their phone or their computer while they're on the meeting because having constant ding, dings is kind of annoying. So just ask people. Hey, while we're in the meetings, just turn off all your alerts. You can turn them back on or turn off the audio part of your alerts. Roles. So here's some roles I'm going to suggest for you to consider. So you have a board meeting, you have a board chair, you have an executive director, and the board chair might be pretty good at running the meeting when you're in the room together, but running a meeting online takes some different skills, and the executive director doesn't want to be the one that calls on everybody. So you might find that you want a facilitator. And a facilitator, me, is the one that might do the round robin, would call on people. So the board chair or whoever runs your meeting can just kind of watch the agenda and keep it going. And they might work hand in hand with a facilitator who could be the executive director or it could be another board member. And the facilitator would be the one who calls on people, who keeps the, the circle going with conversation and makes sure that we are using different ways to engage. Although the plotting of the, the planning of the meeting is where you're going to decide. This time we're going to use the voice this next time we're going to use chat box. This time we're going to use a visual. The facilitator would be the one that could look around and call on people. The next one to think about is a note taker, which of course is probably your secretary. It's something you could consider because we're not meeting together might be using Google Docs for doing your notes. 
And then people who want to go to a second screen can go and look at the screen and see what's going on. If you haven't used Google Docs, it's just a way to, it, this is a time to explore. People are very patient right now because we're all learning different ways to do this. So I found people are patient, but they're also kind of eager to learn some of this stuff. That's what's really exciting. People, want, you know, they've been thrown into this, but they're like, okay, I'm thrown into it. I want to be good at it. So the idea of a note taker would be how can you use some, how can you use the notes to share the conversation, put the notes up on the screen so that people can see the screen while, while the notes are being taken. The next one would be having somebody who can do technical support. It doesn't have to be a big deal, but they're the ones that are going to maybe watch the box, the chat box, if somebody's having trouble with audio or video, or they're the one that'll go find the person who's, there's a loud, you know, the sirens going down in the background and they might go just mute that person. They might have to answer through the phone, some text from people who are lost. Just a little bit of technical skills. The next one is a timekeeper. The advantage of a timekeeper, and this is something you could do in your meetings face to face, but what happens online, because we don't have those visual clues, I could start talking and talking and talking. So what you might want to do if you're calling on somebody for the facilitator or the person, the board chair perhaps might say, we want to hear from everybody and we're going to give you a minute and we're going to go around the room. Or, and we have a timekeeper here. And the timekeeper is going to set an alarm or make a beep at the end of one minute. And you have 10 seconds to finish. I mean, we're all going to agree to this, but what you're doing is trying to keep one person from talking forever. So you go around the room and have everybody answer for a minute. And then maybe you could say, does anybody else have anything further they want to add about this? Put your thumb up and we'll catch you or wave. And so that way you are allowing for people to add more information, but you've gotten everybody on the first time around. Sometimes what I'm doing, I might ask for people to give one idea, not two, because somebody, one group could go through and give, you know, all their ideas. Don't do that. You want to move it around and keep everybody able to contribute. And the last position to think about is, I'm just calling it a Yoda. I read that in an article, and so I'm borrowing that art idea. Now you're going to borrow it. The idea of a yoga would be somebody, a Yoda would be someone who at the end of the meeting might be the person who can do some feedback as to what worked well in this meeting. What who, how your flow went. It could be also a person who kind of talks about oh, the elephant in the room. Oh, I'm seeing that everybody's not talking. A little bit different than the facilitator who's going to be calling on people. It just gives another role to the another person, the Yoda, who might say, it seems like there's a lot of silence around this issue. Or you could assign them to be the meeting evaluator at the end. What did we do well as a group in this online meeting? And what can we improve? And then the next time you meet, you switch it all up. So somebody else gets to be the Yoda or the timekeeper. So five roles, the, the advantage of moving around is engagement and just having these, being a timekeeper keeps us moving along, having a facilitator calls on people. You really don't want to just say, okay, who, who's next? Now, some people have gone to call having, if I answer it, then I get to call on the next person. That can work. It also can take time because I have to figure out who's talked and who's not talked and I have to look around. It's an engagement tool. It's something to consider where each one who talks Count, call, um, calls on the next one. I like having a facilitator who moves it along. And I like having a timekeeper who says, oh, time's up. So at least we have some borders, some parameters happening. Here's some ideas for uh, your rules of engagement. And again, I think your board needs to decide, well, what do we want? Do we want to have a one minute time limit when we ask a question? You can come back for a second chance, but just one minute we'll walk around the room. So you need to decide what rules work for you. So the first idea is you co-create your own rules. The second idea is use names. It helps because some people might be on the phone yet. Some people might have turned off their camera. I mean, if there's only six of you and you're all on the camera, you can look around. But if there's 12 of you and two are on the phone, just make just get in the habit of using names. First, you say your own name. This is Jean here because it helps. Don't assume everybody can recognize voice. Help the people who might have the hardest time hearing. The third one is define what your facilitator role will be so that everybody's clear what what we expect from the facilitator and then we can be comfortable when that facilitator takes that role and who is the facilitator is is your board chair comfortable being both leading the meeting and facilitating online does the board chair want the executive director do you want somebody else decide who you want to do that and how you want to handle that situation to define it number four is as i said earlier plan for engagement and talk to your people about how engagement is important it's a business meeting. We need everybody here. When we say put something in the chat box, we need everybody to chat. When we, if you're in Zoom, you can break into small groups. 
I've seen nothing but engagement when you do that. And I think if you break into small groups, you have 12 people and you have four groups of three to talk about a question, and then you come back together, you could spend three or four minutes in the small group discussing an issue, and then everybody comes back and you spend three or four minutes more in the highlights of those discussions, that's eight minutes, and you'll have had a really good discussion. So look for some ways that you can use small groups and tell people why this is important to do engagement. Number five is ask people to come camera ready, meaning don't let that be an excuse for not joining. Be ready. You know, whatever it is that you need to be comfortable, make sure that you can come to the meeting ready to show your face because that just helps build relationships, helps us collaborate more. Number six, create a common focus, a visual focus. So it's helpful if you put your Google Doc up here with your notes on it. If you have a um, financial report up there, you can put that on the screen. If you have a um, slide you want to show, you don't have to do a whole lot of PowerPoint slides. You could put the agenda up there and put a check mark when you're done with an idea. Whatever you want to do, it helps to have occasionally switch the visual focus. Sometimes it's good just to have all the faces there and we can look at each other and talk. And then sometimes we can switch to look at a document. I mentioned this earlier, what are your protocols for leaving the meeting if, if there's a conflict of interest? If somebody needs to just get up and go out of the room, do you want them to tell you? I mean, what I've seen is people, you can see them, their face and their audio. So they mute the audio and they mute their face because they're going to get up and leave. So they could just leave a note saying, be back in just a minute. What happens when I'm in a meeting and I have to go to the bathroom? I get up and leave the room. We all see that I've left. So if I just mute it and go away, people don't know that I've left. So you could just say, be back in a minute and mute and go take care of the screaming kid or the barking dog or whatever you got to do and then come back and just wave that you're back. People don't know that you're not there. If you just mute the screen and mute your voice and disappear, they don't know if you're just there being quiet or gone. And then you can supplement it with other virtual communications. So you can use the chat box. You could use other programs that people use, such as Slack. You might be able to use texting. If there's other ways you want to communicate with people, I know that sometimes I've had to text with people in these meetings because they didn't, they couldn't get into the meeting. So just be aware of what are the other ways you can connect. And as part of your rules of engagement, are you going to do something like that? There's also some of these surveys like Mentimeter, Minty, Minty, where you can do a poll. There are a couple of programs where you can all answer at the same time. So that's something fun if you want to have everybody answering questions so you can get a sense of where people are at. I give you this as an example of a visual way of how to share kind of thoughts. I'm going to let me just skip something over here. I'm going to go to the screen so I can make sure I'm showing my hand. So basically you're in a meeting and you, you you're at a point where you just want to say, are people with us? So this isn't a voting. This is decision making. So what you might say to people is, OK, I want to see where people how you how you feel about this issue. Are we done? Are we ready to move on? Or are you more information? And so everybody's going to pick between fist to five, zero to five. So what we're going to do is I might say, I'm at a five. I'm not there at all. I need a lot more information. Somebody else might say, I'm at a three. I'm kind of neutral. Somebody else might say, I'm at a five. But they don't have to verbally say it. We can all just put our hands up and it's a way to check in with people. So you don't have to have everybody talk every time. You can just say, okay, we've, we've talked about this issue. I want to see where people are and you need to define these. So you come back. I got to get my cursor back over here. There you go. So you want to define how you see the zero to five. If, if that's too many, do zero to three. But the idea would be, you're not just asking yes and no, can we move on? But you're saying to people, hey, is this working for you? Have we, have we talked about this enough? Is this an idea that we want to consider? And you're giving people a way just to put symbols up and you can talk. So I'll show you what it looks like. Oh, one more thing. You can define this that zero to two means we don't have consensus yet. But three to five means we have consensus. So what you've done is you've broadened out your discussion so it's not just yes or no. You're giving some room in the middle for people to say not quite there and it just helps you have a deeper discussion because you can't read my face necessarily but I've had to choose with my hands. So that's what it might look like. Another way would be to have people say are you with me? Yes. His fingers up. Uh, need a little more information and not share down here. So you're just getting people to stick it up in front of the screen and vote that way. All right. 
And that's what that would look like if you had your board, if you asked your board something and they all responded. So you have their hands and how they're voting and you get a sense. It looked like most of those people had a thumbs up, but some of them had a thumbs to the center. So then you could say to people, well, Mary, what is it that makes you feel like you're ready to move ahead with this? Or Stan, what is it that makes you, you're not sure? So it gives you information where you can have a more engaging conversation. Or Jamal, I see you're not interested in this idea. What, what more do you need to hear before we move on? I've seen this, I kind of cut and paste this to make it happen, but it's the idea that somebody actually might have a flipboard at their house and you could do a brainstorming and they could turn their camera where you can see the screen and they could write on it. I mean, I've mentioned this once and somebody actually sent me a text and said, I've done that. I have the screen at home and we've done this with my computer. So I'm just saying, be creative. This is a great way if you wanna have a brainstorm, ideas of what we're gonna do for the fall. So the person who has a screen could write and then turn their, they turn their um, iPad or their computer so they can see the screen and then everybody can watch and you can all talk and hear the ideas. It's silly, but we've got to be creative and it works. An, an idea on facilitation. And the hint here is you're going to need to be a little more pronounced in your facilitation because we're not all in the same room, because we don't have those visual clues. What I want you to see here is in the middle. This is from an article in the New York Times about Google trying to create the perfect team. And I thought this was a great comment because it says, as long as everyone had a chance to talk, the team did well. But if only one person or a small group spoke all the time, the collective intelligence declined. Well, the idea here would be, how can you get as many people as possible talking in your meeting? It should be true in a face-to-face -face meeting, but you can make it happen in these meetings. And it doesn't just have to be talking, it can be through the chat box, it can be through you know contributing in ways where we do visuals. But how can you get more and more people contributing and not just sitting there because they don't know how to interact with the camera. If you're the facilitator, you need to establish a lineup to call on people. It could be alphabetical, random, it could be based on location. If you're, you know, from across the country, you might have people from the West Coast and then people from the East Coast and randomly call on people that way. If you have um, people in different parts of your county, you have, you know, northern part of the county, southern, North Carolina, South Carolina, you might want to mix it up that way. Another way you could mix it up would be the ordering they enter the call and just write their names down. You could create a chart of all the board members before they get there and just keep track of who's chatting so that you make sure you get to everybody. But I mean, if I go through a round, I would do a check mark and then set time limits for sharing. So when, again, when you ask a question, you might say, let's go around the room. We'll give you all a minute to answer. If it takes longer, we'll do a second round and you can give more thoughts. We want to give everybody a first round. Most people aren't going to take a minute. Mostly it's there for those of us who talk a lot. For those of us who don't talk a lot, we're not going to take a minute. But it's it's a equalizing say to everybody, one minute. You want to clarify from people that you expect them to participate. That we're looking for ways to hear from people. We're going to call on people, and but you don't want to catch people un, unguarded. What you want to do is engage people. So sometimes I call on people, and that's right in the moment where they've looked away because something's happening in their room. I mean, we're not trying to embarrass people. We're just setting the tone that not only you're coming to this meeting, but we're going to find ways to engage everybody and get you to talk and vote and interact that uses all these tools to their optimum. So we, we ask that for all of you board members. The yellow square is blurry on purpose because I don't want you to read what's written there. I'm trying to share you this as a visual way to do a facilitation. And this works for some people because they have like a clock technique where when people enter the room or they just have a list of everybody and they put it in the clock. So every time somebody, Laura, who's number one talks, I could make a note if I want to go back and ask her something later. As the facilitator, I'm, we're moving around, but Laura said something and I want to make a note and come back to it. And then Ray says something, and I wanted to make sure we come back to that. That's part of what a facilitator can do is say, okay, now that we've heard from everybody, let's go back to Laura. You made this statement, da, 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 da. Can you explain that a little more? So the idea behind this is just one person's way to be more visual. You could also just print out a chart, like on Excel, put everybody's name in, in a row and just have ways that you can track who's talking and when. Now, the other idea for something like this is it gives you an order to call on people. But you don't always have to start at number one. The first time around, I start at number one and work my way around. The second time, I might start at number four. So the same person is not always the first one to answer. And if you only have nine people, you only have to have nine names in there. And if you have 14 people, you could put people's names in between like the 1230 and 130. 
this person used this to take some extra notes inside and I'm not following up on that. I just thought it was a nice visual, a, a way to take notes and keep track of who's talking, what they said. And if I'm the facilitator, I wanna be able to follow up with some of the comments. So you can look at the blue picture on the right. It's just kind of the idea of a round robin, working your way around. This is an interesting way somebody used the whiteboard on Zoom once. You could probably do this with a Google Doc. But when people come onto your meeting, you could have everybody sign into a number. So that becomes their number. And every time you ask a question, you could put, a, if this was a Google Doc, you could put this back up and have people write in that square their answer. You, if it's a whiteboard, you have to be able to save the whiteboard and use it and come back to it. It gives you a way to have an, to call on people. If you only had nine people, I'd only make nine squares. So you only have one square per person. People could sign in at the beginning and put their name there. So then you know who belongs to what number. If I had a question and I wanted to say, I want people to think about should we do X or Y, and it's a couple of words, you could have people write in there a comment or two. You can move on to another Google screen that looks just like this. So think how you could creatively use Google and people signing in so that they could, and I could be the first one on the meeting, but I sign in as number six. So it really doesn't matter there. You're just allowing people to sign up and pick a spot. But how do you keep the remote people engaged other than some of the tools we've talked about? So one of the things that I've talked about that I want to mention is the idea of using your chat box. An interesting way of using your chat box, and I have found this to be very successful, is I pair people up sometime and I say, Angie and Lucia, I want you to be a group, and Libby and Rosie, Rosie, I want you, so you go into private chat and I only chat with that one person as if we were doing no, talk to the person sitting next to you. But instead, everybody gets assigned to one person. That's what the facilitator might assign them to. The board chair, whoever wants to, can assign them to speak in pairs. And what they're going to do is have a chat, a private chat, back and forth. And you want them to give their answers or their thoughts about a certain decision or a direction you're looking at. So I put in my idea, and my partner puts in his idea. And then we go back and forth for a couple of minutes. Then we come back to the meeting. And everybody's chatted. So if you have 12 people, you've had six chats going on. So then you could call on people and say, what jumped out from your chat? What was the most meaningful question that you wrote? Or what was the most meaningful statement that either you wrote or your partner wrote? So you can get people to share. And what you're doing now is you've had that first round of just having comments. And now you're having the second round where we're analyzing a little bit and looking for trends. So we're getting to a little bit deeper discussion which is something you could do again in a face-to-face -face meeting, and sometimes we don't do that. So it's private chat. The other thing you could do, I already mentioned, is you could have everybody answer in the chat box and call on two different people to look in the chat box and say, what are the patterns that you see? What is the answer that's jumping out that you think? Or what are the questions that we most need to answer? So I'm calling on, as the facilitator, two other people to be the ones to read the chat box so that another voice is coming in and another person gets to give some feedback. So you're using the chat box to just have ordinary comments, you're using the chat box to have a dual conversation, and you're using the chat box to have a third party read and give a kind of an analysis of the patterns and the trends. What you want to do, some tips would be have that agenda, make sure you stick to your agenda. That's how the Yoda can help you, that's how the facilitator can help you so that you don't go down those rabbit holes when people bring up other questions. What's useful when you're not all in the same room is to make sure we stay true to our agenda. Your pace is important because sometimes you have to go slower because people have to hear what was said. Sometimes when I ask you to write an answer, people start putting the answers in the chat box and it takes a while to get there. So you're sitting here going, nobody's answering, but they are. It just takes a while. So sometimes the pace needs to be quicker and sometimes it's just slower. So just be aware of the pacing. Avoid presentations. As much as you can get different people just to give ideas, but not just sitting there reading a report. When I say vary your voice tone, that's good for you to do, but it's also the idea of bringing other voices in so we can hear lots of different voices. Ask provocative questions on that. I say have some of your questions written down and thought of ahead of time. If you don't need them, you don't need them. But if, if you kind of have reached a lull and there's not a good question, you can look down at your notes and you got a good question. I would recommend round robins just going to whirl around the room and you could have plants in the group so you could say to somebody you could say to let's see if there's another name I can get over here I don't want to move my screen um, 
call on one of the people in your meeting ahead of time and say, I'm going to ask this question, and I'd like you to be ready to speak about that. Well, you could do that for any meeting, but it's even better when you do it online because then somebody is ready to answer it and say, well, I've been thinking about that, and I'd like to join in right now and share my thoughts. So then we have after the meeting. So after the meeting, what usually happens is, okay, here's the proverbial water cooler that we talk about, but I would say a lot of what happens in board meetings is in the parking lot afterwards, right? Everybody goes out there and goes, what did she mean? Or what did he mean when he said that? Or do you know what they were talking about? So instead of waiting for that to happen afterwards, bring it into your meeting. And what I'm suggesting here is have a way to discuss at the very end of your meeting, you could use your chat box, you could have people write it down, like use a pen and paper. What worked well in this meeting? And right now, what's really useful is people are gonna be willing to talk about, well, you know, it was a lot easier than I thought to be able to do mute and unmute. And we could hear from everybody. What could be better if, and people are gonna talk about the technology, but eventually you're gonna get around to talking about, you know what worked here is everybody talked. What worked here is we heard from everybody. And I'll tell you, I like to mention this a lot, Board Source said, groups that evaluate, boards that evaluate how they're doing tend to do better. Because once you start paying attention to your work, you get better at it. So what you're thinking of here is, starting with questions like this, but then you could move to questions like, have everybody write down, what could be, what, oh, let's see, I wanna say, what, what was, how did I contribute to this meeting? And have everybody just write down how they contributed. And then you could share it out and they could send it through a private message to one person, or we could just share it out if you feel comfortable sharing it out. Or it could be, what is one thing that we could do to make this meeting better? What is one thing we did in this meeting that we would like to not repeat? Start out with positives, get people to feeling good about reflecting on the meeting. I think you're gonna find this is a good part of the online meeting because we don't have that way to connect to each other afterwards. It's very easy for people to look at what's working well and what could be better. It's, you could put this up as a Google Doc. Not, it doesn't look like this. Yeah, I mean, it could look like that, but you're basically going to give people a chance to either type in the chat box or type on a Google Doc. The other idea I think about is I would ask people to have a pen and paper ready because sometimes when you have a question, you might, I've seen this work well. Say to everybody, this is a question we need to think about. We're going to give everybody two minutes just to write down some ideas. So everybody just sits and writes. And you think, okay, but what's good about that is some people are much better reflecting if they can write. Some of us can talk from the get-go and some of us need to reflect and write. So what you're doing is you're making it equal ground for everybody. If you were just to say, let's just stop for a minute. I want everybody to pull out a pen and paper and let's spend two minutes with you just writing down all the ideas you have about what we should do. It's a great way to have that first level of brainstorming. And then you could have people either take, take your best two ideas and put them in the chat box. Or take your best two ideas and have a one-on-one -on -one chat with somebody. Or if you have Zoom and you put them in breakout groups, then you could go to the breakout groups and have everybody share two of your ideas from your two minutes of writing. So what you've done is you've created a way to have people talk and then think and write and not just be in the group together. A little bit about tech tools, more about platforms and what's out there, because I want you to be thinking about all the different ways you can get involved with using tech in these meetings. These are the different categories. I'm going to just touch to each one so you get some ideas. But there's tools to help you with remote meetings. And I'm not going to mention platforms so much as I'm just going to say some ways that you can think about using these. For example, with collaboration, you could share docs. Certainly with Google, you could put a Google Doc up and have everybody on their screen go to that, send the link to them. I'll go to the screen. And what I've seen people do is have a, have a group brainstorm where everybody types at the same time. But you gotta put your name at the beginning of the sentence because sometimes it's over top each other, but everybody could just be typing. And it's been very successful. It's the same energy because we're all together and you start seeing all these ideas appear. So we all type on the Google Doc at the same time. You can use collaboration when you're doing planning, when you're doing decision-making, brainstorming. All of these can be ways you can do collaboration and sharing docs in your board meetings. Communication, you can think about group chat, so we're doing the chat box all together. We're doing a video call where we're all seeing each other and talking. You can do the polling the way I suggested it. I mean, this is polling without doing polling. Or you can do Minty, M-E-N-T-I. That's one of the polling. There are a lot of platforms out there where you can get a visual platform. But you just say to your board, are you here with this? Are you in the middle and need more information? 
or you're just not on the right path. And that's a quick polling. And it's visual and very, it's a way to keep people engaged. Um, using visuals, so we share documents, the screens we look at. You can use texting if that matters. Where it's a way to connect to people. If you don't want to use a chat box and everybody has texting, you can have people text back and forth to each other. Everybody get everybody who's on this meeting, we're going to pair you up because everybody has phone numbers. You put them on the screen and you put people together. And instead of sharing comments in the chat box, we have people text back and forth about an answer or a question. And then we just have our regular voice. So those are all the different ways you can think to communicate. Platforms, we have Zoom, there's Skype. If you have Windows Teams and Hangouts and WebEx and this one today, go to a meeting. So you need to decide which platform best meets our needs. The nitty gritty would be how are you going to allow access? How are you going to work on access for people who don't have it? Where, what are you going to do about passwords? Sometimes people have project management tools. Do they integrate with the program you're using? If you have a workflow, if you have ways that you're sharing information or saving information. So you want to make sure that whatever platform you use matches the tools you're using. You want to make sure people understand the login directions, that you have them clear. And I would say, have a way to send this to people ahead of time and then like half an hour before the meeting. Because you know how it is, we have to go back and search through all our emails and we're all crazy right now. So just send it again with all of what the information they need, you know, maybe an hour before the meeting and make sure your subject line is like board meeting today information, you put the date so they can easily find it and they don't have to go searching through. The number of times I thought I had the connection and because I have 15 emails from that person, I have to go through every email to find it. Team building, you can do stuff with breakout groups. You can, you're building your team with chats, one-on-one -on -one or groups of three. When you have people reflect, how did we do today in the meeting? When you have people sharing some of their, all of these are pieces that are building your team camaraderie. And then number six would be, how can you use icebreakers? What's your facilitator? How are you gonna use roles? How might you use whiteboards? So this is something you think about, the, the link at the bottom list all the tools you can buy. It was just a site I found online. I just took their categories because I thought the conversation would be useful. Most of those tools that they mentioned are going to be higher level than most of us want to use because who wants to use all these different tools? But if you really like them, there they are. Now I want to share with you, these are some of the, what we've talked about today in terms of online tools. Screen sharing, chat box where I just answer something, chat box where I have a private chat, chat box where somebody looks at the patterns, the visual polling, some kind of collaborative writing, brainstorming together on a Google Doc. We can use breakout groups. We can share documents. If you want to send really large uh, files, I've used WeTransfer. You probably don't need that, but I just want to throw that in there. There's some way you can share files. And then round robin calling on members. So just if you're planning out your meeting, make sure you think through, when am I going to do round robin? When are we going to do a chat box? When are we going to do just a visual, I mean, a, a discussion where we're all just on here? looking at each other. Final tips for you would be to make sure you know what makes a good meeting and copy that into your meeting. What would make a good meeting regardless of where it is and bring that in engagement, discussion, attendance. What virtual meetings need intentional facilitation. So I said you need to have more obvious facilitation. It's not a time to be a real quiet. Not quiet's not the right word, but a facilitation needs to be more upfront than it would be. You need to plan ways to engage people, and you just got to know that there's going to be tech challenges. There's going to be loud noises at times. There's going to be people falling off, and just kind of stay positive. So I would like for you to use the chat box. We've not been interactive today. This has been more of a webinar because I wanted to give you a lot of ideas, but I'd love to hear from you now. What's one idea you're going to take away of how you're going to engage your group? And then we're going to open up for questions, but first I would like you just to type into the chat box. What's one of the ideas you've heard today? One of the tools, something you're going to try that you haven't thought of before? Or maybe you have, but you see a different way to use it now. Icebreaker, people like that. Facilitation during the meeting. Thank you, Dallas. Peter and Jessica are going to use icebreakers. Let's hear from some more people. Pat's going to do more round robins. Yes, yeah, Susan likes that clock technique. And Kate is going to pair participants for private chat. It really works well. Kathy's an icebreaker. Elizabeth likes the chat ideas. Um, Nancy likes the idea of assigning roles. Anne's going to think of icebreakers. So if y'all use an icebreaker, email me and tell me what you've done or if you do any of this stuff, because then I can use your story in my next training. I love to get ideas. Barry likes the roundup at the end, so the next meeting's even better. 
And you know, Barry, the first time you do it, people, actually, I think they're gonna be pretty good at it because we can say, we're doing these online meetings, what can we do better? So it makes it easier and eventually you can move into more of the dynamics of your room or what, what kind of culture you want within your boardroom. Robert likes the chat, the chat, and the chat. Alicia likes having tech support for those uncomfortable. So do think about just assuming there'll be issues and say, hey, anybody wanna come in 30 minutes early? We're gonna try everything. And then by the time the meeting starts, you'll be great at it. Any other ideas? It's slowed down. We saw a bunch of ideas in there. So it's still a bunch of you on here looking for, I like getting everyone to speak. Yes, Patricia, and you know it's not that hard. Make sure you do a round robin, make sure you do some timing, have some good questions. Don't just let that first person be the one who always talks. Move it around, start at a different place, start with number four, start with number eight. Dean likes icebreakers, round robins, question prep. Dean, you just like everything. Good for you. Try them all. Successful. So, you want to know if you have any questions like what's this, how do you make this work? How do you make it work? Why don't you type those questions in now? Because we have a couple minutes. I'm willing to hang out. It's three o'clock. If you got to go, I understand. But if you want to type a question in, I'm willing to sit here and listen to your questions. So, anybody want to put something in the chat box? Go for it. Okay. Well, allow me to interject here, Gene, and say that it's a great idea. If people have questions, to feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we can also send out a communication uh, after this to respond to some of those questions. But I want to thank you, Gene, for all of the great tools and tips that you've been giving us this session. Uh, and for those that do need to to move on to, to other things today, I want to thank you to all the participants for the great work that they're doing in our community. Um, again, we will post a recording of this session as soon as possible. I um, hope that you have a great rest of the day. Thank you again. Happy Cinco de Mayo. And please continue to stay safe. So if, if those want folks do want to stay and ask some questions, we we're happy to, to stay on for a little while. So I'm not seeing any questions yet. People are saying thank you and got some ideas. Looking forward to taking this to my board buddies. Go for it, Patricia. And Lucia, thank you. Phil is thanking you. <laughs> okay. I, don't, I don't see any questions. Pardon? All right, well, thank you all. We will end the session, and Jane, I'll be reaching out to you shortly. All right. Bye. Thank you very much.